Well, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Governor Huntsman here to Stanford and to this program. He's accompanied by his wife, uh, Mary Kay, uh, who's uh, here joining us. Mary Kay, welcome to Stanford, and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> The governor has a great deal of uh, uh, contact with this region. He, I learned at the lunch that his grandfather was the mayor of Palo Alto, so he, he knows this region very well. <laughs> uh, governor Huntsman had, has had a quite distinguished career, and much of it is written in the, in the handout, so I'm not going to go into all a great long introduction. But uh, at, uh, he was... Uh, entering uh, his first public service as an assistant to President Reagan uh, at a very early age, I might say. Uh, he then became uh, the deputy uh, trade commissioner at a very early age. Uh, he was then the governor, uh, the uh, ambassador to Singapore, again, at a very early age, I might say. <laughs> and uh, then he became the uh, governor of uh, Utah for two terms, again, you know, at a very early age, I might say. And uh, more recently, he was the ambassador to uh, China, again, at a very early age. If he gets much younger, he won't be allowed to vote. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's had this wonderful experience in government as well as a, a role in business. And so we're going to have a little uh, conversation here. You see this empty chair. I'm not going to speak to it. <laughs> I'm going to go and sit down with him and have the conversation. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Governor, again, welcome. And uh, I have an opening question. What inspired you to go into public service? <laughs> well, let, let, let me put my my biography into perspective. You were very nice to mention all of those things. And having said all that, you know, I'm pretty much unemployed at this point, so it tells you where all of that gets you. But uh, so I'm, I'm a failed musician and a failed politician for the most part. And uh, what does a failed musician do? You go into politics. That's a logical, <laughs> that's a logical progression, I guess. But what inspired me most, you mentioned uh, uh, my grandfather, Haight, uh, who was mayor of Palo Alto uh, when I was born here. I was born here in 1960. I've always held it against Stanford University because they wouldn't uh, take my mother when she was uh, big with baby. Uh, our family was on the GI Bill. My dad was in the Navy at the time. So they sent her down uh, the road to Redwood City. And I was born at uh, Sequoia Hospital. Uh, and I've always kind of held it against Stanford all these years that <laughs> they never took care of my mom. Well, now's your uh, chance. <laughs> <laughs> but my grandfather, Haight, who ran the hardware store here, Palo Alto Hardware, for many, many years, uh, he was a Navy officer. And my grandfather, Huntsman, who was principal of Los Altos High School down the road, was a Navy officer. And their uh, family members, sons, were in the Navy as well. So everywhere I looked, uh, I saw public servants of a different kind. They were wearing uh, the uniform of uh, the Navy, as my two boys do. I have two boys uh, at the Naval Academy who are preparing for careers of their own. And so uh, during my formative years, uh, all that was talked about around the dinner table was service and doing something good for your community and giving something back. And I've, I've always carried that around with me, thinking that, as my grandfather Huntsman would have said, who was principal of a high school, the highest rung of success in life is that of being an educator. It doesn't get any better. My dad failed. He went into business and broke his father's uh, heart. I broke my dad's heart by going into politics, uh, not into business. But in the end, what is it that matters most? It is, it is service. Uh, as I like to tell college students around this country, you know, when all is said and done, you pretty much have a couple of words that are etched on your tombstone of life that kind of summarizes everything you've done. And it all seems to kind of get right back to one core principle, and that's 
what you've done for others, service, what you've done for your community. So for me, I know it sounds altruistic and, 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 and all, but I think that's the most important thing you can very do in life. Very inspiring, very inspiring, thank you. So this program is China 2.0, and so we're gonna ask pro uh, questions about China, where you've had all this great experience. And uh, you've been in, involved in China for more than four decades, as I understand. And what do you see are the key drivers behind China's um, uh, rise, uh, their economic rise? What personal experiences g can you share about China's expanding role as a player in the global economy? You know, uh, everyone likes to talk about their ties to China, at least in my business of diplomacy, which I left not long ago. Those who are kind of, at, you know, part of the founding generation of the U.S.-China relationship, my good friend Winston Lord, uh, who was preceded me uh, uh, a couple of times before, Dr. Henry Kissinger, uh, a friend as well, who uh, really laid the foundation for the relationship. They like to talk about being there at the creation. Well, here's my story about being there at the creation. You know, so 1971, the year that Henry Kissinger took a secret trip to China, July of 71, my father was working for Nixon in the White House, was there for about a year, then couldn't take it anymore and moved on. Uh, and the only time I saw my dad was on weekends. And I was out uh, roaming around the White House, a much different kind of lay of the land in those days, looking for the Coke machine. And I ran into a guy by the name of Al Haig, who later became Secretary of State, then Colonel Haig, who worked on the National Security Council staff. He said, young man, do you want to shake the hand of Dr. Kissinger? National Security Advisor at the time. I didn't know who he was. I was just, I was just a lost 11-year-old uh, roaming around the White House. And uh, so I shook Henry Kissinger's hand. Didn't register much. Uh, he said, will you help me carry the bag out to the car? And so I took his black bag, walked to West Executive Drive, which is just adjacent to the White House, where all the big black sedans used to depart from. And I said, where are you going? And he said, don't tell anyone. It's a secret. <laughs> he says, I'm going to China. <laughs> that didn't register too much at the time. 11-year-old kid, lost to the White House looking for the Coke machine. But that was my connection to the opening of the relationship with China. <laughs> I helped me carry Dr. Kissinger's bag to the car. Uh, my friends in China like to refer to that period, 1971, and then the visit by Nixon in February of 1972. Here's what's interesting. Can you imagine a president of the United States, forget the party, uh, getting on a plane and traveling to the country of, uh, of an antagonist and getting off the plane and shaking hands with the premier, as Nixon did Zhou Enlai, and later went on to meet uh, Chairman Mao? I mean, meetings that transformed the world. It just doesn't happen anymore. But my friends in China, and many of you here in this room will get this part, you know, that period is referred to as, as China preparing to enter the world. You know, at the time in 72, we were fighting each other in Vietnam. We'd fought years before on the Korean Peninsula. China lost 400,000 men, including the son of Mao Zedong. No commerce, no trade, no cultural interaction. That was the environment into which this relationship was born, based on the big balance of power picture and the Soviet Union. And then I fast forward history you know, to 2001, when I was a trade uh, ambassador and helped to get China into the WTO after a lot of work by the Clinton administration and then the Bush administration. In Doha, Gutter, November, 2001, and my friends in China refer to that period as China entering the world. And then I fast forward history to when I landed there as the U.S. ambassador in 2009, a Republican serving a Democrat, because I think that putting your country first is probably a good thing to do, uh, and we don't do it enough in this country. Thank you. And, I, and I'm not running for anything, so don't worry about political lines. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here to, to have a, a conversation. 
And an, an interesting thing took place in those years. You know, by 2009, not so long ago, the relationship had gone 40 years of a, of a pure bilateral relationship, all of the traditional bilateral uh, ties and, and related uh, issues, to a global relationship. And uh, China's rise was driven by the Deng Dynasty, which started with the reemergence of Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s. And he'll be remembered for three things. Opening the doors to the world. Back then, China had no trade with the United States. Now we're $400 plus billion, soon to be the largest economic relationship in the world. Deng will be remembered by number two, throwing open the doors diplomatically to the rest of the world. If only you will abide by a one China policy, we can do business. And then number three, He'll be remembered and his dynasty, which comes to an end, interestingly enough, next month at the 18th Party Congress, because the new leaders, the fifth generation, nobody was anointed by Deng Xiaoping. They're all newcomers. And he'll be remembered number three by primacy of the party. You know, the party will be the primary organizing unit in politics in China. And that has remained constant. And here it is today, the party with, I don't know, 80 million members, 3,900 organizing units around the country. Uh, and moving into the 18th Party Congress, wondering how to stay relevant. And I think that'll be a huge question before everybody as the fifth generation begins to rise up and take the reins of power. But it, what you, you would have had to have been a fool to think 40 years ago that a country with 1.3 billion people, a large land mass, roughly the size of the United States, with access to raw materials and secure trade links to all of the major markets of the world, with a history of capitalism and market expansion, pre-1949, wouldn't grow and grow fairly quickly, particularly if you were willing to manipulate your currency and build up through investment uh, a large export <coughs> machine, which you know Taiwan did, uh, Korea did, uh, others in the Asia-Pacific region relied on a similar economic model. And so here we are, not only with the fifth generation politically beginning to take the reins, but an economic model that is worn a bit thin, the investment and the export model and the desire to move now more toward more of a consumption model. So is this period in China's history important? No question about it. And is it absolutely critical that somehow those ties between the United States and China uh, be enhanced based around shared interests as opposed to those things on which we disagree, which we read about in the paper every day? Yeah. And that's where we're not getting it right. And it concerns me. Well, uh, thank you for that very enlightening uh, 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 answer. I have another question. It's about China's political and economic challenges that it's facing. Uh, they've recently been marked by sagging markets and a property bubble that seems to be uh, still abating a little bit but going on. Difficulties with consensus in this change in national leadership we hear reported. Are these just bumps in the road or are there some long-term issues there that we should understand and how might we deal with them? I think they're rather historic uh, in nature. It's a fundamental economic transformation. It's, uh, it's a fundamental political transformation. And uh, the policies that are set uh, based upon, you know, so the five-year plan most recently that was officially enshrined last March, and uh, the leaders that begin to take over uh, beginning uh, November 8th, they just announced the date of the, uh, the 18th Party Congress. Interestingly enough, right about the same time that we're having U.S. elections here, <laughs> I think my friends in leadership in China are, are, are getting very smart about how the cycles of politics work. And you can go through this political transition and be somewhat under the radar screen if it happens right about the same time that the U.S. election happens. And they figure that one out. So these are historic transitions that are happening. And uh, I, would, uh, I would argue that key, key to success 
will be the government's ability to convince the average citizen in China that they have built enough confidence into the system in terms of China's direction that they can now pull out some of their savings, which is very high, and invest it in their future. That will be key. How do you build confidence among the average citizens of, of China such that they're willing to now invest more in their future? And you say, I wonder if that time has arrived where there is, in fact, more confidence uh, in the overall direction. You, you just have to look back to, you know, just go back to the opium wars of eight, 1860. And then the, the, the Taiping Rebellion of, of the 1860s. And the Boxer Rebellion of 1900. And the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911. You know, the rise of the party in 1922, 23. The invasion by Japan in the early 30s. World War II, 1949. The Great Leap Forward, 60 to 64. The Cultural Revolution. 66 to 76, and you say, people still wonder, you know, with every 20 years or so, uh, some sort of disruption in the system, an unscheduled event, uh, if you will, uh, an incursion, a revolution, a takeover. And the government's challenge now is to convince the citizenry that we've got a safe trajectory ahead, that we built enough confidence in the system and we can begin to merge from an investment-led model to a consumption model. This is not an easy task. And you combine that with the political challenges of riding a country with 600 million internet users, 90 million bloggers, having conversations that would have landed anyone in a very bad place a few short years ago. How do I know that? Because I invited the largest bloggers in the country to my home when I was ambassador. Not everybody showed up because it's not always a safe place to be in the U.S. <laughs> ambassador's home for these kinds of conversations. But we had 12, I think, that showed up, and uh, some of the largest bloggers in the country. Two of them had readerships of 125 million bloggers. And the kinds of conversations they were ha having in, in my living room about political reform, about the role of the Internet in society, et cetera, et cetera, were just uh, profoundly important and dangerous, I might add. But you can't take these conversations and dismiss them because they're, they're widely discussed and they're important for the future of China. Not because the United States says so, we're not saying that, but because the people of China, the next generation coming up, are saying so. So the, the stakes are high and the challenges are significant in terms of the pathway ahead. So this timing of the uh, party Congress to obscure the U.S. election or to... <laughs> well, that, that, that's a bit um, the, the cynic coming out in me. What, what, I've, <laughs> what I've found in China among the leadership is some of the brightest, most capable people on the world stage today who have a much better read of uh, public relations, and public opinion uh, and the trends of history and politics. So by, by comparing and contrasting my first trip to China, even though I'd lived in Taiwan in the 1970s, my first trip to China was with uh, President Reagan in the early 1980s when he went in uh, 1983. Went to Beijing and Xi'an and Shanghai where he went to Fudan, Fudan Dashia. And he spoke to the students, so I'll never forget, you know, packed in this auditorium about this size. You know, students were hanging out the windows. And Ronald Reagan stood on the stage and spoke to them, this young year, in which he called for nuclear disarmament. I mean, if anybody remembers that speech, it was pretty remarkable. Nobody remembers those days. But uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable. Um, and so here we are uh, in these cycles, and, uh, and they continue. So um, another question. You were there during the Google conflict uh, two and a half years ago, and their decision to change the way it operates in China. That led to a lot of debate about uh, how Western companies could operate in China. So as we look back, what lessons uh, could be drawn from that experience? One very simple lesson in the case of Google. Uh, consult with the Chinese before you make a decision. 
So that applies many that, places. That, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a partnership in China, uh, or e even if you don't, even if you have pretty much a wholly owned subsidiary or a corporation in China, uh, uh, it's always a wise thing if you're making a major market move uh, to give a heads up to uh, the regulatory people, uh, the regional party bosses, something that would signal that the relationship is more than just kind of a short-term deal. And I think Google, at least my own take, uh, probably learned that very important lesson that uh, they misfired on the communication. As I remember, it was announced via their site, their website, and uh, without a lot of heads up. And it, it, it caught the leadership, uh, forced them into a corner, which is not where you want to force the leadership if you want a longer term relationship. And uh, it uh, thereby made it impossible for them to do other, anything other than fight back and to criticize that decision. But it was also at a time when, and we did some reporting on this in the embassy and uh, sent some of it uh, back to Washington, State Department, White House, and other, that later showed up in the WikiLeaks. So, you know, even though it was classified stuff, you know, we, we, we can now talk about it now because it's all out there. Uh, and, and, and some of the leaders uh, in Zhongnanhai, uh, in their White House, you know, were kind of figuring out what Google was, Googling their names and, you know, bad stuff would come up. They say, this is, not a, this is not a helpful tool. You know, they're criticizing us. How can this be? So I think, I think going into the whole Google incident was already sort of a, a negative opinion of, uh, of uh, technology that brought forth information that wasn't helpful in China's growth and evolution. Thank you for that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the innovation in China. Uh, some believe that it's a lot of sort of Me Too firms that are going on. Uh, that there are a lot of uh, powerful government policies that uh, uh, drive that. Uh, and there are other views that China is really a hotspot of uh, soon-to-be new innovations. Uh, how do you view that? Do you have a view of, uh, of the role and the level of innovation in China? So what is it that the leadership would like to do longer term on the economic side? They're going to have to tame the SOEs. They're going to have to figure out how to regularize them in terms of their practices. They're going to have to work on corporate governance, transparency, procurement, uh, financial transactions. Uh, they're going to have to focus on uh, opening up some of their markets. Uh, insurance and, uh, and banking services would be a couple of them. But I think longer term, they'd really like to crack the code on innovation. How do you do that? That's a tough call. You know, it's hard to describe fully how we do it here in the United States. It just sort of happens when you've got the right geography, access to capital, a lot of smart people, good uh, higher ed institutions, uh, and governments that speak to growth. China would like to do that. You know, Singapore wanted, I used to serve on the Economic Development Board of Singapore back in the 90s after I'd served as ambassador in the early 90s. And I think China is keenly interested in how you put the pieces together for innovation. And I think they will get there uh, at some point, not as fully developed as we are today, but I think they'll begin to develop some of the, the, uh, the elements necessary for innovation. Now, combining that with innate talent and brain power and an entrepreneurial drive. So in my travels around China, visiting I don't know, most of the provinces uh, over a couple of years, I'd always make it a point to meet with local entrepreneurs and students, because you get a good sense from the next generation what's on their mind, what they like and don't like about the United States. You get a lot of really interesting feedback. Whether you're in a big city like Shanghai or whether you're out you know, in, uh, in, uh, in Xining, you know, out in the Southwest, and what I found to be extraordinarily powerful in China was um, the, entrep the, the entrepreneurial drive, uh, and I don't even know that people would term it this, but the ability of, of this younger generation to understand the marketplace, to capture opportunities, to begin to naturally network, uh, and to take these small entities increasingly public, you know, kind of a billionaire a day kind of thing. And after meeting entrepreneurial group after entrepreneurial group, I walked away thinking, this is the power of China's tomorrow. 
and when unleashed, there's no looking back. It's, uh, it, is the, it is the entrepreneur in China that I think is going to drive growth, that I think is going to take to the government uh, issues about market access, uh, uh, about um, intellectual property rights protection, because the United States can only go so far on a government-to-government -government basis. And when the entrepreneurs begin to take hold of these issues, I think the outcome is going to be a whole lot different over time. But I would have to say, innovation will evolve slowly. And what it looks like vis-a-vis -vis the US type of innovation you know, is certainly uh, an open question. But the raw material for innovation in the human capital is very real in China. And I walked away with uh, a strong impression of what that's going to mean uh, for China's future. Just as I walked away with a view of the modern day bureaucrat in China, the old guys in Mao suits, the Central Planning Commission, no English, no education. They were revolutionaries in the early days. They didn't have time to go to school. And you walk into the ministries today, foreign ministry, commerce ministry, NDRC, suits, English, the best universities in the world, and an ability to read the United States in a very mature and advanced way. Insights about my own country that would impress me. And I'd say, here's a challenge for the United States. You've got the bureaucracy in China that's getting better. They're recruiting good people and they're training them uh, to do their jobs. And you try to find anyone in the Congress of the United States who knows anything about the subject matter. <laughs> and you can't find it. You walk into our departments and agencies and try to find folks who understand China as well as they understand us. This is a challenge. And somehow, some way, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to deal with it in this country. Because you don't want to be disadvantaged at the negotiating table time after time because you're outdone. So. Um on the innovation issue. Silicon Valley is recognized as one of the great centers of innovation, uh, technological innovation and business model innovation. What are the opportunities for collaboration between China and Silicon Valley in particular? I think the emerging trends are going to be based on uh, industries that are compatible with the direction of the five-year plan. So it's pretty easy to understand where China's policy making is going to migrate, where the economy is going to go, uh, and where the focus, the emphasis will be uh, under, uh, around the new leadership. Uh, and that will be industries and technologies that support this migration to a consumption-based economy. So I would say services of various kinds. What else are they going to have to do in order to build confidence in the population? You've got to address health care. You know, if we forget sometimes, you have know, 700 million rural poor in China on a per capita level, you know, 99th, uh, number 99 in the world in terms of per capita income, China is somewhere between, you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo and, and Armenia. Um, retirement, financial services, travel tourism, health care. Uh, these are all going to be er uh, areas of great focus and concentration when you look around the bend. And uh, the technologies and the know-how and the connection with the digital age that begin to aid and abet and facilitate some of these services industries, personal services industries, travel and tourism, banking, health care, I think are going to be significant. You uh, mentioned the emerging uh, young people, and, and, you, uh, and they, you touched on the education system. You've always had a great interest in education. How would you assess the training, education they're getting, and preparation for the kind of things you're talking about, about dealing in a global economy? I think it's getting better. The young kids in China at least many of them that I interacted with, have a great facil facility in English. I was blown away on college campuses in my interaction with young kids in auditorium like this after auditorium. Uh, their knowledge of the American system, uh, their ability to put the pieces of the relationship together 
uh, I thought were, were quite advanced. Now, broadly speaking, I think China's trying to migrate more toward uh, a different educational system in the sense that you go from the rote style uh, to something that's more critical, more so Socratic in terms of uh, student-teacher interaction. And I think they're learning a lot about how we do it here in the States, our, our better practices uh, in educating, at least at the primary school level. Uh, and I think they're instituting some of those practices in China. And it's being helped by uh, intellectual leaders who were educated here in the United States who are increasingly are going back to China uh, and helping them in this endeavor. Now, you've kindly agreed to take some questions from the audience, and so let me see if we have some questions from the audience. We have microphones here and there. If you uh, do have a question to the governor, and you would uh, uh, just identify yourself, and uh, we'll take the first question over here on my right. Governor, a couple nights ago, Bloomberg reported that <clears throat> Facebook has 63 million users in China. And yet, theoretically, that's not possible. Would you care to comment on the, the Great Firewall <laughs> yeah. and, and, and yeah. its future? Well, let's just say uh, I, I had uh, some daughters in China who were very active on, uh, on, on the internet. And getting over the Great Firewall took them all of three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, if my daughters can do it, so can every other person in China. And so the reality is you can try to throw up a, a barrier here and there. Uh, it doesn't work and it doesn't last. And there are going to be technologies that uh, work their way around whatever barrier you throw up. And I think that's why the, the fifth generation of leadership coming up, I think they get this part. And you can only hold back people so long before you have to come up with a longer term internet strategy, openness strategy, that I think is consistent both with the political implications, which are, which are very real, but also with the economic development implications. And I'm guessing in the head of, of Xi Jinping and in the head of Li Keqiang and in the head of Wang Xishan and in the head of Wang Yang and then the head of Yu Zhengshan and in the head of uh, Zhang Dejiang, uh, all the people who are going to occupy positions uh, at the top, maybe even Li Yuanchao, that they're thinking in their head, we've got to solve this one. And longer term, we have to have a strategy that's, that, that accommodates innovation, getting back to that key pillar on the economic development side. You can't have an innovative society. You can't have the kind of uh, entrepreneurship broad-based without access to information and uh, an active uh, use of the internet. You, you, it's simply impossible. And I think they're smart enough to know that. So my guess is that, you know, so you have to give the new leadership time. You can imagine, Next month, you know, 2,000 delegates are going to descend on Beijing, and uh, they're going to appoint the 200 members of the Central Committee and about 150 uh, alternates. And then they're going to go into plenary session, and they're going to appoint the 25 members of the Politburo. And then they're going to figure out the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Will it be seven or will it be nine? You know, it was nine, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, it was seven before 2002, before the 17th or the 16th Party Congress. And Zhang Zemin, when he left, you know, he, he instituted a few changes, like uh, a retirement age of 70 to get Chao Shi out of the out of the Standing Committee, and and then they lowered it to 68 uh, to get Li Rei Huan out of the uh, out of the Politburo. <laughs> and and so we're going to see changes every every step of the way, but I'm guessing it will be with seven members of the Standing Committee, and give them a year or so to consolidate power. Once power is consolidated, I think then reforms begin. And top among them, I do believe, is going to be dealing with the internet in society. It's a big one with political and economic implications, but it can't be avoided forever. So we have a limited time, but we have a number of people for questions. So please make your questions short, and we'll go right over here. Thank you, Mr., for sharing our, uh, your experience and uh, insight about uh, U.S. and China. And as well, our topic is about global digital economy, I think it's also about uh, digital, global digital generation. So we see in 2008, 
the digital generation in the U.S. selected Mr. Obama as the current president. And we also said in 2010, the digital generation created the Arab Spring. So my question is about what, um, what, I, what are the things you trust on Chinese digital generation and what are the concerns about us? I fully appreciate if you could give us some <laughs> advices. Thank you. Thank you for your question. This is a tough one to answer, and it's a great question. And I wish I had more in the way of uh, re real insights. There, there's a, a very tech-savvy generation in China that's coming up and a very networked generation. You all know the numbers uh, in terms of cell phone usage and internet usage and all. And on one end, and you have to remember, last time I spoke out on this subject, on the Arab Spring, my name was banned from the internet in China. So I was, <laughs> the, the, out, the outcome wasn't a good one. Uh, but the, the generation that you are part of will drive change. And I think that's very good. And you should maintain your conversations about your aspirations, your goals for your generation. The flip side of that is the speed with which you can change the system. You know, we want change and we want it now. The system will only be able to accommodate so much in the way of change uh, in the next few years, timed, you know, uh, to hit certain political cycles. You might, I think we're going to have probably, I don't know, a three to five year opening, a window, uh, after uh, Xi Jinping and his generation consolidate power for change before they have to close things again. Because any watcher of, uh, observer of uh, Chinese politics would tell you that, you know, it ebbs and flows. Before every party congress, you know, where there's a party congress every five years and has been since the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, you know, you have a little opening and then you have to close up. Then you have a little opening and then you have to draw back. So change, yes, your generation will bring that about based on the digital economy. But it's the expectations of your generation and where things might go that could cause for some wind shears now and again politically. And it's hard to know how that would play out. So I think um, time is nearing an end, and we'll take one more question. Sorry to disappoint all the other people. You've been so good with all these answers here. But let's take a question over here. This is our last one. Governor Huntsman, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm a local venture capitalist, Terry Garnett, who went here to the business school. Um, the Chinese appear to be very savvy about their foreign policy, especially trying to drive an economic agenda. And I think Governor uh, Romney recently touched about how we should use foreign aids more strategically, economically. And as a foreign governor, uh, former ambassador, I'm curious, do you think we should restructure the State Department, the way we staff it, the type of person who runs it, to make it a more economic organization as opposed to, you know, the kind of issues we get into, which I think get us in trouble around the world? You know, it's, a, it's such a, a valid point. China's foreign policy is driven by one, sovereignty. You look at the maps from the Qing Dynasty, 1911, 1912, that which was laid out as our territory, including Xinjiang and Tibet and Macau and Hong Kong and Taiwan and South China Sea and the Diaoyu Islands, et cetera, et cetera. That will be our goal to begin to recover the lost territory. And everything's pretty much been recovered except a couple of those. Uh, and then beyond that, it's an economic approach, which I think is sound foreign policy. Why? Because strong economics is going to facilitate growth at home, which keeps unemployment low and stabilizes the political system. I mean, pretty, pretty much con that keeps the party in power. Back to Deng Xiaoping's driving philosophy uh, from his days in power. In the United States, we have a hard time recognizing that economics should be salient uh, in our foreign policy. If we got that part, we wouldn't have the bureaucracy that we do. You know, we would have taken 
the Department of Commerce, Department of Treasury, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office functions within the State Department, functions within the National Security Council, and reorganized around something that unifies and uh, coordinates better our economic policy agenda. And we would lead with economic policy because that is the music that the rest of the world uh, tends to want to dance to. And it's also, there are the issues that carry real leverage in today's global economy. And uh, the Chinese understand uh, that a foreign policy should be led by economics for all the reasons we've discussed. And I think our future will absolutely depend on being able to recognize uh, uh, first and foremost a proper use of economic policy driving our foreign policy. So let me just end with this thought. How do you clean up the Middle East after we've kind of been there for 10 years? You gotta clean it up. I mean, we have a mess and a lot of us because of bad policy from the United States. And we, we haven't had a conversation in this country about that yet, but we have to, at some point, recognize the region, the Middle East, what we have done based upon our policy and how we can make it better. The only answer, to my mind, is we have to start utilizing our economic policy levers because you've got to address the pockets of despair, whether in North Africa or the broader Middle East or South Asian region. When there is despair and unemployment, what do you do? You turn to radicalism. And the Madrasa movement facilitates that. We've got to somehow put in those pockets of despair through free trade agreements or economic initiatives, regional economic initiatives, uh, some sort of growth agenda that gives people and our exporters, you know, something. Everybody comes out ahead. And I hope that we wake up in the near term and find that we have a stronger international economic policy in this country. Oh, God, Thank you very much. Thank you.